Um, I'm excited to walk through some of the core building blocks of what makes for a, a best in class win loss program. There's a lot of content to get through here. So I'm going to move at a pretty rapid pace. If you have any follow up questions, my email address is at the end. Feel free to reach out directly to me. Let's go ahead and see. Okay. Um, if you haven't already heard of Clue, uh, Clue is an organization based out of Vancouver. Jason Smith uh, is the founder who's on the call with us today. Uh, Clue actually brings together competitive market and buyer intelligence to help enable the organization with a lot of great intel to help them make strategic decisions. As you can see on the bottom left-hand corner, uh, Clue has been a leader in a number of G2 areas uh, over the last quarter. Ultimately, what Clue does is they pull together uh, information that's available, whether it's from internal sources, publicly available information, and now buyer intelligence to help create actionable insights and deliverables to help organizations be more competitive. So Clue helps to support sales, marketing, product, customer success, competitive intelligence, the leadership team, really anybody who is involved in planning and strategy uh, and selling for the entire organization. There's some stats down here at the bottom. So today we're talking about win-loss uh, and why is it especially important today? When we look at what's happening out there in the economy, we're all facing headwinds. Uh, and those headwinds mean that we're seeing budgets shrink or just go away completely. We're seeing buyers move from one organization to the next or to nowhere. You know, We might have an opportunity with somebody and then they're gone the next day. Um, our marketing qualified leads are shrinking over year over year. Our pipeline, of course, is shrinking as a result of that. And, NRR is also suffering quite a bit. So a lot of the key metrics that we depend on to look at the health of our organization, and we hope that they go up, this year, unfortunately, are, are going down. And because there's less budget out there, we have more competition for that budget. So competitors are doing all kinds of things to try to scratch and claw to get those deals that are out there. Uh, so it's become more and more competitive than, uh, than it has over the past couple of years. At the same time, because those competitors are making all kinds of strategic moves to try to get those opportunities out there, we're seeing things like consolidation, we're seeing desperate acts from different vendors who are trying to win deals. Partnerships are being formed to try to bring two like organizations or complementary organizations to create more of a compelling value proposition. Incentives are being offered. We're seeing all kinds of things that are different than this time last year. The challenge, however, is that while some people have great resources and a setup to be able to keep pulse of what's happening out in the marketplace and be informed of those changes, most of the time, organizations don't. They don't have a regular source of information from um, competitive intelligence, from buyer intelligence. They're just, they're struggling a little bit today and they're losing out to those organizations who do have that, that well thought through information infrastructure in place. Uh, and a lot of those organizations are, are really turning to sales to be able to understand why they're winning and losing deals. They're going to reason codes uh, within a CRM system. They may even be interviewing sales the challenge, however, is that you know, sales doesn't always know the answer to the question of why they won or lost. They might guess, um, and they often don't provide a very detailed account of what happened. Um, in addition, you know, buyers are the people who really understand what happened soup to nuts in every evaluation they're part of. So we believe we've seen you know, much greater information coming directly from buyers than sellers. So those organizations who are taking the step to conduct win-loss interviews themselves are getting more reliable and more complete information. And of course, self-serving, this is my, my one plug for the, the presentation, but those who turn to third-party win-loss firms like Clue um, get a lot of really great insight to be able to help inform strategic decision-making. 
So today uh, we're gonna be focused primarily on your in-house win-loss efforts and how to structure a winning win-loss program. So as we look at the key building blocks of a win-loss program, today we're gonna focus on seven areas. The first is we're gonna talk about who your internal stakeholders for the program are. We're gonna help you identify what the learning objectives are for those stakeholders. We're gonna then move over to looking at your transaction volume and helping you determine who are the right targets, the ideal interview candidates to reach out to. We're gonna help build your conversation guide or your interview guide to interview those, <laughs> those targets. We're gonna provide some tips on outreach strategy, how to get people to speak with you, how to conduct, conduct awesome interviews to get detail, deep detailed intelligence, and then how to analyze that data uh, to create meaningful research deliverables that will help drive the type of change you're looking to have um, happen. So let's start off with identifying your stakeholders. On the right-hand side, these are the usual suspects uh, as far as stakeholders are concerned for most win-loss programs. Um, they're typically the functional leaders within your organization who can benefit from some intelligence that is offered by buyers during win-loss surveys or interviews. If we look at product marketing as an example, um, product marketing is super interested, as you all know, in understanding their go-to-market blind spots. How is our message resonating? What are our competitors doing? What type of work can I do to help enable sales? So they're squarely in the middle of the target for being a beneficiary of a win-loss program. Then we have product management. So these folks, as we all know, are really eager to understand how their solution is being perceived in the marketplace. Where might their gaps be? And then what do buyers feel they should prioritize as it relates to their roadmap? So any information these folks can get through win-loss program will feed right into their product visioning and strategy meetings. Um, to help prioritize and just inform maybe blind spots uh, that are needs of the marketplace that they were unaware of. Also getting a lot of great competitive intelligence. What are our competitors offering that is resonating um, that we're not offering today? Then we move into uh, competitive intelligence, of course, looking to understand everything they possibly can about our competitors, whether it's their product differentiators, their pricing and packaging differentiators, what their go-to-market strategy is, what are they saying about us as an organization, what is their sales team doing differently or better than we are today. So any intel related to competitors, and this is a huge opportunity within most win-loss programs to collect a lot of insight that they couldn't get otherwise. Uh, sales enablement is the next usual suspect. So of course, we're digging deep into how each salesperson or sales team performed during the win-loss, I'm sorry, during the, the sales process to be able to unpack, did they differentiate well? Were they able to articulate the pricing model? Were they professional? Did they add value? Were they consultative or transactional? So this information is super helpful for not only sales enablement, but for the sales leadership team to help make sure they're investing in the right areas of sales training to improve their outcomes and, and win more deals at the end of the day. Um, then we get into customer success. Of course, this is really tied to churn. So when we're looking at win-loss programs, we include churn as part of the scope of most of these programs. So where today we're seeing big NRR hits across the board, customer success is eager to understand what can we do to retain more clients and more wallet share? What are the things that our competitors might be doing to, to encourage our clients to look elsewhere? Um, if I was to go back into the customer lifecycle, what changes can I make to make sure that our clients are happier in getting more value out of the program that we put in place with them? So another great opportunity for win-loss. And then finally, senior leadership. So we are seeing a lot of boards require their senior leadership to come to board meetings, prepare to talk about the competition in detail, uh, prepare to talk about win-loss reasons in detail, 
And up to this point, you have a good group of leaders who can do that. You know, they have a pulse on what's happening in their opportunities, but there are many who don't. Um, and they're quite separated from what's happening at the field level. So win-loss programs help to inform those leadership teams uh, to make strategic decisions, but then also to help with uh, their board meetings to make sure that the board has a good understanding and a confidence in that leadership team that they're doing the right things and they understand what's happening in their in their space. So those are the stakeholders. Um, so at this point, you know, when you think through your organization, there are different flavors of win loss. They might be more heavy, heavily focused on competitive intelligence or product feedback. But who are your stakeholders? Write those folks down. We're going to now go to the the next phase, which is really trying to unpack. What are those stakeholders interested in as it relates to win-loss research? Um, are they interested in business drivers and really trying to identify why organizations are looking for solutions in the first place? Are they trying to unpack what specific criteria are those, are those buyers looking for when evaluating our solution as compared to others? So there are a lot of different potential areas that your stakeholders may be interested in, but it's really important to sit down with each one of them and go through and kind of conduct an interview of sorts. This is a sample output of what one of those interviews would reveal about, in this case, product marketing. So sitting down with our head of product marketing, we might find that they're really eager to understand how you're all being perceived in the marketplace, what you're reputation is amongst buyers and customers? Is the messaging that you're using that you created the previous quarter or maybe last year, is it still is it still relevant? Is it still aligned well with what the market's looking for? So like, what are those topics that product marketing is really interested in understanding? And then on the right-hand side, what we like to do is sit down with those folks and get a sense of where they feel their greatest blind spots are. You know, what is your burning plot area today as it relates to uncovering insight that, that you don't quite have. In this case, our product marketer is looking for more um, information on their reputation and uh, more feedback on that go-to-market motion and how it's being received by, by customers. Then we get into uh, what three questions that particular stakeholder would ask in a win-loss interview. So if you were the one conducting the interview, what do you want to know? What are, the, what are the questions that you would ask? So if we're able to document those for each stakeholder, we have a good starting point for what a, what a uh, well-aligned conversation guide might look like. <clears throat> and then at the end there, you want to really ask each stakeholder, like, what is their vision for the use case uh, if they had the data today? So if you're a product marketer and you have all this great feedback, about your messaging or about your, your reputation. Like, what are, the, what are you gonna do with that information? Like, how are you going to take that insight and turn it into some sort of training or go to market campaign or inform the leadership team? Like, what are those things that you will do with the data uh, once we have it? So this is an example of what one of those interviews may look like, but we recommend that you sit down with all of those stakeholders that you've identified to be able to have this discussion and capture this information. From here, um, if you can take that information, you can start to analyze it and identify across the board, across all stakeholders, what are the areas of greatest importance or interest? And you can see here on the left-hand side, we've identified four primary stakeholders. And on the right-hand side, we have a, a group of topics or themes that these, these folks mentioned during your interview. And we've identified that competitive intelligence is by far the first, uh, followed by product feedback. And then we've got a bunch of other areas that are important as well. But when we look at this data, we know that when we're conducting win-loss interviews, we're gonna spend more time on competitive intelligence than we are on the pricing model. And we're gonna spend more time on product feedback than we are on the demo experience because this is what the stakeholder group is looking for. It's not that we won't cover those other areas, but we have to recognize that we have an, a half an hour on the phone with somebody to interview them. And we have to make sure that that interview is well aligned, it's meaningful, and that the data that we're collecting aligns with those 
interests of the stakeholder group, and that will lead to them using the data in a meaningful way. It will lead to a more sticky program. And it's worth mentioning here that, that this will change quarter to quarter. You know, what is of interest to the stakeholder group today may be very different in six months. So you, you wanna do this, go through this exercise on a fairly regular basis. Hey, hey Ryan, over a period yeah. of time, are there certain questions that you would always include? In, in the interviews? Yeah, in an interview. I mean, like, like, are there two or three that are really just like, I, this is what I really want to know. And, and I would, I'll, I'll put other things around in terms of competitive analysis and product feedback, but, but I want this always. Yeah, you know, we, we always want to know um, why they selected you or didn't select you, right? That's pretty, you know, when, whenever we talk to somebody, that's the first question they ask yeah. us to, to get the answer to. We want to understand what other companies they looked at and what they thought of each one of those providers. Yeah. Uh, we want to understand, you know, what their perception was of you coming into the evaluation. So I, I wouldn't say there are a few, there are many <laughs> like good questions that we like to ask in each interview. Um, and we actually have a whole section in this presentation focused on that. So um, I'll, I'll defer um, to, yeah. Sorry, I was, I was just going to um, interject really quickly. You know, a hundred years ago, when um, I did exit interviews um, on win loss analysis, one of the first questions we often ask is, "How well did we understand your problem?" Yeah, it's a good one. Right, um, and what was the perception of our company addressing it? So that that was often kind of in our top five. I really like that because it's quite it's a little bit counterintuitive as well. You get people really kind of being on, well, yeah, not so much. Yeah, exactly. And then, of yeah. course, you really understand why they bought. Yeah. So, yeah. anyway, that's good. How about that, Chris? Yeah. So, so what we've done here is we've taken the um, the learning objectives and we've taken the the questions that we collected from the different uh, stakeholders, and we've started the process of building out a conversation guide. And as you can see here. Um, we have highlighted those stakeholders who had an interest in understanding the corresponding question. So if you go through this exercise, you can start to identify like, well, what are the good, what are the questions that everybody kind of wants to know the answer to? Like, what are the org wide questions we'll call them? And then if we start to, to peel it back a little further, we can then start to look at like a tier two and tier three set of questions. Um, in this case, a tier two would be what are our product gaps and key differentiators? Um, and then a tier three might be um, what would you change about the demo experience? So th this is a technique that you can use to try to figure out and prioritize what key questions should be worked into your conversation guide. These might be questions that you've already you're already planning on asking. But it's important as you're going through the process to say, okay, well, that was an important question for our stakeholders. It's already in my conversation guide, but I want to make sure not to skip that one and maybe even probe a little bit deeper into the answer that I get back. The next process uh, step here is in, in the interviews with stakeholders, we also, as you recall, asked what their use case was for the data. Like, what were they planning on doing with the outcome? And here... What we've identified are five different outcome areas, uh, board deck, go-to-market messaging, product strategy, et cetera. And then we've aligned those use cases with those stakeholders to once again identify like, well, what did everybody really wanna use this data for? Um, and in this case, it was the board deck. It looks like at this organization, they're all involved in delivering content at the board level. Uh, likely on a quarterly basis, and they wanted to make sure that the win-loss program was data was leveraged as an input into that, that process. And then we get into things like go-to-market messaging and product strategy. So what, what we try to do here is identify those um, use cases. So as we're thinking through the data that we're collecting, we're also thinking through like, well, what are the deliverables that we can create that would have the highest impact coming out of this effort. And let's start to plan for those. Like, what do you need for the board deck? What do you mean by go-to-market messaging? What about product strategy? When is your next product visioning meeting? Um, how often do you meet? What kind of inputs can we provide? So this is a really important step to ensure that the insights are being actioned upon. 
uh, and then there's value coming out of the program. So here, you know, as you're going through those stakeholder interviews, we want to make sure that you, you learn something through the process. And once you've gone through this analysis, you do want to meet with your stakeholder group as a team once and then go through what you've come up with just to make sure everybody's aligned with your analysis and that you're, you're approved to move forward with, um, with, with the recommendations that, that, you're, that you're making here at this point. Step three uh, is where we're identifying the ideal interview candidates. And this can get tricky for a lot of companies, uh, small companies who might have one product, uh, might be selling within one specific region or two. It's pretty straightforward. You know, we wanna interview wins and losses. We sell to this one buyer type, we sell this one platform. Um, Easy, pretty easy to, to assess. Maybe they decide that they wanna go, you know, above $100,000 in ACV, that's their, their line. And those are the people that, we want, that they wanna target. Other folks are not quite that lucky. They might have a hundred or more products. They might be selling to different geos and different buyers. Uh, they might have different sales teams. So it's really important for anybody starting a win-loss program, whether large or small, to take the time to really look through how they might think about segmenting the data that they're collecting so that they end up with meaningful insight. So if you're looking at a company that has five products selling to unique buyers, they're going to want five, at least five different streams of data. And they're going to want to be able to isolate those streams and analyze those streams in isolation to be able to identify like what's going on with product A versus B versus C. Uh, what you might want to do is download your transaction volume from the previous quarter and start to look at the filters uh, that are applied against your target list, whether it's region or product, deal size. That's a good way to get started to identify like, well, how could we think through filtering and creating these segments? You also will want to, for win-loss interviews, eliminate your top of the funnel deals that went quiet. Maybe they ghosted you and they were, they were turned to, to close in the system and focus primarily on the later stage opportunities. By doing that, you know that you're going to be interviewing people who have gone through your entire sales cycle and likely this entire sales cycle of your competitors and can provide a lot of great detailed intelligence about their experience, soup to nuts, versus top of the funnel who may have met with your salesperson and then they, they moved on and they don't really have a lot to say about you. Um, maybe they didn't have budget, maybe it wasn't an approved, in, you know, approved evaluation process, maybe they were just window shopping. Uh, you do then want to start to uh, create those segments through your uh, process and be able to make sure that you have at least 30 ideal interview candidates per segment to be able to uh, have that particular segment be have enough sample to be meaningful to go after. Um, if you have if you end up with 10 interviews out of the 30, you have enough qualitative data to start to see some statistically relevant insights. If you have less than that, you're gonna just have some anecdotal interviews and you're not really gonna be able to do a lot with that data. So that's another process for down selecting the segments that you, um, that you might wanna target. So when we uh, move through the, the next phase here, we're starting to think through that interview guide. And now that you know what the learning objectives are and you've started to collect a, a, some questions from your stakeholder group, you can that next start to really figure out like, well, what are the sections of the interview and what are the types of open-ended questions that I might decide to include here? Keep in mind with a half an hour interview, if you're, if you're asking open-ended questions, you might get to 12 to 15 solid open-ended questions. So you really have to prioritize your efforts here to make sure that you're um, 
not creating a super long interview guide that you'll, you'll never finish during an interview itself. What we will tend to do is we'll look at those learning objectives and we will start to flesh out like, well, what are we trying to learn through each one of these areas? So in the case of a of persona, this might be the beginning of an interview where we're trying to dig into the buyer's uh, role, responsibilities, uh, what keeps them up at night, what who they report to. We can ask some of those questions up front just to get them warmed up in the interview process. We might get into insight into why they started to evaluate you, like what were the primary drivers that led them to go out and look for a solution. Might get into things like bias, like how did they hear about your company? Did they work with one of your competitors in the past? Do they have any sort of bias to work with that competitor or to work with you? We might get into their, their requirements next, key selection criteria, like what are their must-haves or what were their must-haves during the evaluation process and how did those must-haves align with your value proposition and your offering? Competition, big area. We wanna know everything we possibly can get about the competition. I mentioned a number of those areas earlier, but this is a, a area to probe. This is where we wanna go deeper, uh, ask questions about how that particular competitor made the buyer feel, how their pricing made them feel, how their solution aligned with their needs. So there's a great opportunity to collect a lot of intelligence on competition. We wanna know about the buying committee, who was involved in the evaluation process, who was the ultimate decision maker. We want to get into the demo if there was one, or maybe it's a proof of concept or some sort of boardroom pilot or a sandbox environment. But what was that experience like? And what kind of an impact did that experience have on the buyer's decision? Did it help them make the decision to work with you? Or did it lead them down the path of determining that you were not the best fit? Products would be another one. We want to really get deep into your offering, uh, what the buyers felt were, were strong about it, weak, uh, what suggestions they might have about improvement opportunities. Price would be another one. Not only were you more expensive or less expensive, but how did your pricing model align with that of your competition? What about the uh, price to value? Was this something that they felt the juice was worth the squeeze? Your offering was uh, so strong that the price was not an issue. And then sales would be, oh, we've got a visitor. <laughs> uh, sales would be, uh, how was the sales experience overall? What, um, how did your sales team perform? How were their traits and skills during the sales process? How were was their ability to address objections that may have come up? So uh, really strong questions on the sales side as well. So these are just a handful of different areas that come up quite often during the course of the work that we do. But for you, um, you have to go back to those stakeholders, go back to their learning objectives, and really try to build a conversation guide that helps to inform what you're trying to get out of these interviews, but also once again, aligns well to their, their needs. The call to action here is to meet with them once again, or to share the interview guide that you've created with them and have them provide feedback. Did, they, did you capture the things that they were looking to have captured? Did they think of another question that they'd love to have answered? Um, what is a priority to them and what is not a priority to them? So this fine tuning, is a final step for completing the, the conversation guide. Now you're ready to start with recruitment. Uh, this would be a whole other hour long presentation. So I'm gonna just give you some very high level tips on interview recruitment best practices that we've seen. The, the first tip here is if you have a good relationship with your sales leadership team, um, sit down with them, plead with them, and ask them to make sure that your sales team is bringing up a post-decision interview 
with their buyer while they're still involved in the sales cycle. So maybe they're at the shortlist phase. At that point, the salesperson should ask the buyer, hey, you know, we, we take feedback very seriously. We work with uh, our product marketing team to collect information. Would you be open to providing feedback, whether you choose us or not, after you've made a decision? And at that point, they're going to say yes. They're never going to say no. And you've taken a step towards pre-qualifying them for the interview itself, which will lead to higher interview acceptance rates when you're going through your recruitment process. Because that salesperson will introduce you to that buyer and say, hey, remember when you said yes to that question I asked? Now I'm introducing you um, to, to Frank over here, who's going to be following up with that interview. The next one is, is leveraging win-loss interviews during the, the negotiation phase, whether uh, that turns into a win or a loss. But having the, the quid pro quo in your pocket to respond to somebody's request for a discount or request, request for additional services or a longer contract term. If you're willing to do that and you're looking for a good quid pro quo, uh, this is a great one. You know, would you be open to providing feedback? If we were to give you that discount, uh, would you be open to providing feedback after you've, you've uh, made the decision or signed the contract? The third is to, to offer an incentive. We believe that incentives don't hurt, um, they only help. Uh, however, when you're offering an incentive to the CEO of a Fortune 100 company, that's a lot different than when you're offering an incentive to a solution architect. And what we have to do is be really thoughtful about what type of an incentive aligns well to the person that we're trying to get on the phone. And for those more senior people who have plenty of money and a, a small incentive wouldn't matter, take some time to, to do some research. Does that CEO, are they part of a local ASPCA organization? Um, are they you know, the deacon of their church? You know, find out what they're really interested in and offer an incentive that aligns to a charitable donation to an organization they're, they're currently involved with. Uh, Ryan, what kind of, um, how do you compare the kind of take up with um, so requests for interviews for wins versus losses? Yeah. So for qualified targets, we will look at uh, wins versus losses with losses being about a 30% hit rate and wins being about a 60% hit rate. That makes sense. I mean, we, we've done, um, we've attempted a few times to do um, follow up with companies who don't take our investment and we get virtually no take up. I mean, they're so like off. It just, we just gave up, but um, I would thought a one in three is pretty good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, so we, we've done that kind of work. I think I, I, I may have mentioned we've done some VC win loss regarding yeah. funding, yeah. And I think that the uh, the 30% applies to the work that we've done to getting people to respond to us. I mean, it does have to do with the relationship uh, between you and the, the founder or CEO of, of that company or the board of that company. But by asking them, you know, early on, like, hey, I, you know, whether you take our money or not, would you be open to feedback that that will improve your rates uh, exponentially? The call to action here is to meet with your head of sales to discuss the outreach strategy, uh, leverage some of the tips that we just provided to see if they'll be, agree to getting sales to mention that post-decision interview while they're still engaged in the sales process. Um, step six here is how to prepare for the interviews. So not many people who conduct in-house win-loss interviews have done them before. So a lot of times people are looking for tips on what the best strategies might be. So we built some slides here to help out. Uh, the first is, is building rapport, right? We wanna make sure as interviewers that we've done homework on the person that we're interviewing. We know a bit about them. We know a bit about their company. That work up front will make them feel uh, like you, you know, took the time and there's more credibility there than just jumping right into the interview and asking questions. So spend a few minutes uh, building a little bit of rapport. 
express gratitude. It's important to make sure that these folks that we're interviewing understand that we know they're busy and we know that they're, they've made a conscious decision to take the time to spend that with us, to be able to give feedback. So we really want to recognize uh, th that upfront by thanking them for their time. We want to also let them know how the data will be used. Sometimes people get a little squirrely because they're not sure if the data is going to be used for marketing purposes or who's going to see the feedback they provided. So being upfront about that helps to put them at ease and creates a bit more of a safe environment. And then once again, let's talk about that incentive and just confirm, like, you know, we, we offer this incentive via email, just so you know, immediately following this, uh, this interview, we're going to send that to you, or maybe this is an opportunity to ask them about that charitable organization that they're hoping we can make the donation to. All of this being said, by, by going through this process up front, you're, you're kind of lowering their wall a little bit, you're softening the beach, uh, and you're, you're kind of building that rapport so that when you start to ask the questions, they feel more comfortable opening up to you. The other thing is when we're actually going through the interview process, we don't want to jump right into questions about the competition or jump right into questions about the price. We want to make sure that we're following their journey during through the evaluation process, that we start at the beginning, uh, about what led them to look for a solution. And we finish at the end about the selection that they made and you know, possibly some questions about their experience since making that selection. We, we do wanna just follow that natural flow. It's a more comfortable flow for them. Um, and we'll get more interesting insight, more of a story if we take this approach. And then we do like to practice the five why uh, technique, root cause analysis, by really finding those areas, those learning objective areas that are important, and making sure that when those topics come up during the interview, we're probing into those answers to try to get more interesting, meaningful, measurable information. So in this case, the, the, the problem uh, of why this organization was looking for a new uh, solution is, is they, they were looking to replace their, their incumbent provider. But then we get deeper, like, well, why, why was that? Why were you looking to replace them? And they, they mentioned that the provider was no longer able to support their needs. And then we go into the next level of why. And at the end of this, we find out that this particular organization had a disaster happen when one of their on-prem solution providers stopped supporting um, that platform, that application. Um, and they had to, to rush to figure out how to maintain that. And they decided as a board that that was too disruptive to their business and they'd like to move to a fully cloud infrastructure moving forward, which is what drove this organization ultimately to look for a new solution. So, Sometimes people will just give you all of these whys up front when you ask them the question about why they were looking for a solution. But oftentimes you have to probe. And if you're a good interviewer, you know, you have identified that there's more there and you, you really want to practice this approach to getting as much great insight as possible. All right, so uh, here is it, take the time to really figure out like what are the key elements of your approach? What are you going to do uh, to make sure that your interviews are meaningful and deep and, and thoughtful? Um, what steps are you going to take in preparation for those interviews? And what tactics are you going to take during the interviews to make sure you're getting a lot of great insight? Here, uh, we're going we're gonna to wrap up. Let's see. Oh, sorry, uh, just something yeah. else occurred to me. Sorry interrupting you do you ever sure. do a larger scale kind of um self-service within this where you might say like here's a dozen questions we want to ask a big audience or is this always primary first person interviews yeah so there, there's different techniques for collecting uh data at scale surveys are certainly one of those um you know, we're, I think there's a lot of market research firms who will take a script and they'll just call and go through, you know, here are the five questions that, uh, that you want to have answered. We, we tend to have more organic conversations with people yeah. when we're collecting data. It's, uh, I guess anybody could, could read, you know, the five questions and get the answers. And there are technology, I know Qualtrics, as an example, has come out with the capability to send an email to somebody with 
with uh, questions and capturing their video response. You know, so it's not uh, it's not quite as deep 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 as you would get in an interview, but it's not as shallow as you'd get in a survey. Um, so there's different approaches for that as well. That we're we're looking into at Clue to try to do this at scale. Uh, so when you look at analyzing and sharing your findings, this is a part a part where people tend to get a little bit hung up. They've collected all this data. Um, this isn't their primary job. They have other projects that they're working on, and they're really trying to figure out like how do I take what I've collected and turn it into something that is going to be impactful across my functional leaders with sale, the sales team that aligns with the use cases that we identified earlier. So a little bit of an eye chart, but just wanted to show you how we think through analyzing data. So when we conduct an interview, we typically will record that interview and we'll end up with a 15 page interview transcript. The first step is to identify what are the things that are important as it relates to the learning objectives that we have set. So if we're looking at primary win-loss reasons, and in this particular interview, we found out that they selected Clue, um, and the reasons that they selected Clue had to do with integration and automation, we'll want to summarize that as part of our analysis of that one particular deal, and we'll want to pull out some quotes that align well to that analysis. Now, win reasons is just one of, of a handful of learning objectives. You might move to product feedback next or sales feedback after that and write up these summaries. From there, what we tend to do is tag that content. So if we see, and there's different tools you can use for text tagging from an Excel spreadsheet uh, to, to a tool called Dovetail, uh, which we leverage quite heavily today. And by tagging that content, you're able to start to turn this qualitative unstructured data into something more kind of quantitative and structured. So you can see here, we created two tags, integration and automation. And those tags uh, flowed into our tagging taxonomy that we've been keeping. So you can see here, we've had 24 different companies mention integration as a reason that they went with Clue followed by 12 who mentioned ease of use, followed by 11 who mentioned filtering. So these are all key product areas that led to organizations selecting Clue. Now, integration being the number one, we wanna isolate that data and we wanna report out on it. So because of the tagging that you've done, you can pull all those integration quotes into a, a document and you can start to share that document and share some analysis of that document with your sales team or your leadership team, because you've been able to identify pretty quickly that your ability to integrate with core systems has led to many wins for you in the previous quarter. And if you start to identify these trends, um, you can start to report out on all kinds of different areas related to your go-to-market motion, uh, your product, your pricing. So the tag group there under identified trends is related to product, um, but you know, we create win-loss reasons, business drivers, selection criteria, competitive trends, uh, focus on specific competitors. There's a whole lot you can do with, uh, with text analysis. Um, from there, what people tend to want to do is present their findings to the leadership team. Uh, the leadership team sometimes will read every interview summary that you create, but sometimes they're just too busy for that and they just want the, the whim, the what it means. So here, uh, we will start off by identifying what are the key themes from that particular research area that the leadership team should be aware of. Um, and we should, we'll document those at the beginning of the presentation. And then we'll get into each one of those learning objective areas and report out on, you know, what were the primary win or loss reasons? What did people share about our product? So being able to, to build a, a slide per learning objective will help to inform the leadership team, the stakeholder group of the findings that are important to them. And then ultimately we want to have that team prioritize which actions to take based on the data that we're collecting. And within each, each executive summary, we recommend having an action plan so that we can capture not only the prioritized recommendations, but who are they going to be assigned to internally 
what steps are going to be taken, what's the timeline. And when you come back to the next executive summary presentation, which might be a quarter later, you have some data now to report out on you know, what the impact of those actions were that you took or where we are uh, along the line in taking those actions. What stage are we at? What we have here is a, a template presentation that shares how we will typically report out on this data. So one of the leave behinds for us, this would be a you know, learning objective slide. This is what they look like. We typically will provide some of that text analysis or online survey data. And then we get to the end where we are um, presenting the action plan, recommendations, and then the action plan. Recommendations, action plan. So useful tool. Uh, we've had a number of, of clients actually use this to create their own executive summary presentations. And now it's time to launch. Um, so that is the, the workshop for today. I tried to get through a lot of content in a relatively short amount of time. Hopefully it was uh, useful and help, helps you on your win-loss journey. One thing that I will close with is uh, many organizations will start a win-loss program. They'll start to get a lot of great insight from it. However, they might realize quickly that they just don't have the time to do it and they would like to have somebody else help out. So we've uh, created a small mini program for people who wanna dip their toe in win-loss and we call it our quick start program. So feel free to reach out to me. It's five interviews in 30 days, five interview summary reports. It gives people a great uh, sense of the type of value they can get oftentimes to build the business case for, for kind of a larger program. And that is it with 